Morning, everyone. Morning. It's been a while. March, I think. Good to be back uh, worshiping with you uh, here today. One of the things that you'll begin to notice in the next couple of weeks is that in the gospel lessons that you're going to be hearing and that we're going to be reading, uh, there, there's four in a row, and they're parables of Jesus. And in those parables of Jesus, among the many other things that they can teach us, designed to help us think about that, this whole idea of what God is like. And we're going to answer that in, in one way today uh, with the Word of God uh, before us and, and then the hymns uh, that we're going to sing. Uh, you have your order of service uh, laid out for you there that will help us uh, to hear His Word, to, to worship Him, and uh, find out a little bit more about Him and what that all means for us. Let's begin with a prayer. O oh Lord, our Maker, Redeemer, and Comforter, we are assembled in your presence to hear your Holy Word. We pray that you would open our hearts by your Holy Spirit, that through the preaching of your Word we may repent of our sins, believe in Jesus, and grow day by day in grace and holiness. Hear us, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Our first hymn today is uh, God Moves in a Mysterious Way, and uh, that too will help us uh, carry out our theme. And thought about this last night that if there is one good thing that can maybe come out of not being able to have all of us sing, is it really helps you to zero in and focus on the words of these hymns, and, and there are some really good ones uh, today. So God Moves in a Mysterious Way. Merciful Father in heaven, 
I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, He has removed your guilt forever. You are His own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to His will. Amen. Amen. We pray. Lord God, you call us to work in your kingdom and leave no one standing idle. Help us to order our lives by your wisdom and to serve you in willing obedience. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Let's give our attention to the Word of God for today. Uh, that begins with the Old Testament lesson from the prophecy of Isaiah. It's verses 6 through 9 of chapter 55. And it's a wonderful chapter. And I certainly would encourage you, as you have opportunity this week, to read the whole chapter. It's, a, it's just a great section of God's Word. And I think the verses we're reading today will maybe sound familiar to most of you. To believers then and now, seek the Lord while He may be found. Call on Him while He is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the evil man his thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him, and to our God, for he will freely pardon. For, God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. The word of the Lord. You're encouraged to use the psalm of the day uh, for your personal devotion at home this week. I, I think if you look at the refrain, that's as good a summary of that psalm as you'll find. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Of whom shall I be afraid? Of whom shall I be afraid? And I think the, the last verse especially, uh, before the Gloria, speaks volumes. Maybe it's a good sign if you want to have a sign on your front yard this time of the year. Maybe this would be a good one. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Our second lesson. Paul's letter to the Philippians. It's the first chapter. We'll be reading from the last part of verse 18 through verse 27. Philippians is one of the prison epistles of St. Paul, uh, written while he was uh, under arrest, and I think that gives us a little bit of perspective, too, in, in what he says. He's continuing a thought, and he says, Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and the help given by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage, so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. 
Yet, what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain, and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you again, your joy in Christ Jesus will overflow on account of me. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man for the faith of the gospel. This is the word of the Lord. Alleluia! My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Alleluia! I invite you to stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Gospel lesson for today, St. Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 to 16, one of those parables of Jesus about the kingdom. The Savior says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire men to work in his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About the third hour he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour and did the same thing. About the eleventh hour he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, Why have you been standing here all day doing nothing? Well, because no one has hired us. They answered. He said to them, You also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about the eleventh hour came, and each received a denarius. So when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These men who were hired last worked only one hour, they said. And you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them. Friend, I am not being unfair to you. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the man who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. We'll continue with our hymn of the day, uh, one that you don't get the same, but listen carefully because we hope in the future uh, we'll get to sing this one more. We walk by faith and not by sight. <laughs>
in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus, who continues to teach his disciples, teaching us about who God is, who we are, and how all of that works for us, for our lives here and now, and for our salvation. Amen. We're going to go back to that second lesson for the day for our, our sermon today from Philippians chapter 1. Not going to reread all of those verses again. We're really just going to be focusing in on, on just that, that one, I believe, telltale verse uh, in those words from the letter to the Philippians. When St. Paul says, to live is Christ. To die is gain. God help us as we hear his word today. So what is God like? Is God fair? Is God fair? Now maybe you're starting to think, is that a trick question? What does he want me to say? How am I supposed to answer that? Is God fair? Yes. I mean, after all, he's God. God is great, God is good, so God must be fair too. Is that the way we think? Is that what we always say? Probably not. We look around, we, we think, we feel, we say, God's not fair. He doesn't give me what, what I deserve. <laughs> exactly. That's the point. God does not give us what we've got coming. I don't know if you saw the, the little worship summary in the, in the bulletin for today, but that's what it says. He doesn't give us what we deserve. In fact, what he gives us is what we don't have coming. And it says there's a word for that, and it's not fairness. It's mercy. And when he gives us what we don't have coming, there's a word for that too. We call it grace. God's grace. So is, is God fair? God is merciful. God is gracious. That gospel lesson we heard a little while ago speaks loud and clear about this, this so-called fairness of God. The Lord Jesus was, was trying to teach a very valuable, if not a very difficult, lesson there. And now we got these verses here from Philippians, which is also sometimes called the Epistle of Joy. And although it was written under seemingly not-so-joy-filled circumstances, unless you consider being in jail because of what you believe, something that's joyful, even under those circumstances, there is joy here. And there is confidence here. In a word of God like this, to live is Christ. To die is gain. And all of what is packed into that can help us to, to shape our worldview, to shape our, our attitudes about life and our, our feelings about death, and yes, our understanding about the fairness of God. So can we say it? Thank God that he's not fair. Rather, what he gives us is a, is a pattern for a very satisfying present. And of course, he always gives us 
that promise of a glory-filled future. People enjoy life, huh? That's not a problem. Within the framework of, of God's will, of course. People find satisfaction in what they do and what they have. No problem there either inside those same boundaries. The man who wrote this letter did both. The Pharisee, known by his Hebrew name of Saul, he enjoyed life. Life was good for him. But then his life got turned upside down by a rather unexpected visit from the resurrected Lord Jesus. And after that visit, now the Apostle Paul, same guy, just using his Greek name, he had a different view about life. The Lord Jesus gave him a pattern for a very, even can we say for him, a, a more satisfying present. Now, Paul's story is in the book of Acts. You can read that. And, and also from the 13 letters that he wrote. And you put all of that together, do a little cut and pasting there, and you'll get a pretty good idea of what this satisfying present was all about. Namely, being a walking, talking, living, breathing commercial for a living Christ. He said things like, I consider my life worth nothing to me, if only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given to me, that task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. And at, at other times, at different times and different places and under different circumstances, he said more things that that help describe what this satisfying present meant for him. Things like this, it's submitting, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. It's carrying each other's burdens. It's hating what is evil and clinging to what is good. It's being devoted to one another honoring one another above yourselves. It's living in harmony with one another, being careful to do what is right in the eyes of the Lord. And then finally, it's whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. And there's more examples of what that satisfying present was all about. But all too often, we're not very good at any of that stuff, are we? And we don't always do those things. And as true as that may be, and is, therein comes the joy and the confidence for us in, for me to live is Christ. Christ for me. Christ whose life was lived for me. Christ whose death was for me. The Christ who is for me and now who is in me. So that I can know that joy still and I can have that confidence. And I can say and believe and keep working at to live is Christ. You know, sometimes we might be tempted to say, you know, all that stuff, sure, that, that was easy for him. That was easy for St. Paul. I mean, he had such a great faith. I think the apostle might be flattered by that but then maybe not. He would be the first one to say, no, 
This has got nothing to do with me and, and my faith. Anybody can have faith. Faith is only as good as what it's in. And he said, for me to live is Christ. There was the object of his faith. The Bible tells us time and time again in lots of different ways, things like this. These, these are written so that you may believe or have faith. Well, believe what? Believe just anything? Or just believe? No. Believe that Jesus is the Christ and that by believing, having faith, you may have life in his name. You know, sometimes you, you hear people, and maybe we think that sometimes too, we, we talk about trying to find ourselves. People trying to, to find out just who they are. The church even has a group of people that they target now, which they label as the seekers. People who are, are looking for something in life. Okay, I get that. That's real. And, and that's something that, that people can struggle with. But where are you going to look for the answers to those questions? It's another apostle, John, who said, try this. How great is the love the, the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God. That is who we are, he says. And we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. You see, God in time has called you to faith in Christ. And in eternity, you will be like him and you will be with him. No identity crisis there. Thank God that that's his idea of fairness. A pattern that he gives us for a very satisfying present. I mean, how does God being fair mean that we now get to turn life into a mad scramble? A mad scramble to serve ourselves, to, to be somebody, or to, to, to have some things. A struggle that is constant. A struggle that, that can only, even then, end with, with an uncertain end. What's fair about fear? What's fair about, about uncertainty, about frustration about the anger about the concerns we have about all that's going on and around us in our world and also what's going on inside of us life is satisfying when it's lived his way according to his word to glorify him striving to follow the pattern that he has given us for a satisfying present. For me to live as Christ, if I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. And when I die, then what? You see, our satisfying present is, is built on the foundation of what we believe and know is still coming. To live as Christ, there's a satisfying present. But to die is gain, there's that promise. That promise of a glory-filled future. Now, I maybe have said this before, I, I don't remember, maybe you've heard it, that, that there were some believers in the early church who, when they would observe birthdays, would observe them not on the day a person was born, but on the day that a person died. Because they said, that's when the child of God really begins to live. 
sound a little backwards? To die is gain? Hmm. To live, to die, hmm. What shall I choose? Well, that's easy, isn't it? I desire to depart, which is better by far? Really? <laughs> that almost sounds like someone who's depressed. Someone who's pessimistic. Someone who's just given up. You know, the Bible does say, and we often then say it then too, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit led wise King Solomon, who learned a few things about the ups and downs in life himself, to say this, the day of death is better than the day of birth. But that doesn't sound fair. That's not what we're supposed to think, huh? That's no way to live, they would say. Don't you deserve better than that? To die is gain. Because Jesus changed everything. Nothing shall separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's what we heard a few weeks ago from Romans chapter 8. Jesus changes everything. He changed everything about sin. It's forgiven. He's changed everything about death. Defeated. Couldn't help but to think of that great Easter hymn that says, He lives, and He grants me daily breath. That's a satisfying present. He lives, and I shall conquer death. There's the glory-filled future. Thank God he determines and he measures fairness according to Jesus. And it's that victorious, that, that living Lord Jesus who, who left us with this promise. A promise for that glory-filled future. A future. A future when this, this body will never again be falling apart won't be worn down by life or, or beaten down by sin. A future when all tear ducts are out of business, except to cry tears of joy. A future when hearts don't ache and don't get broken, but are filled with joy and peace. A future when bodies will never again have to ride in the back of a hearse. We'll never again have to say goodbye to, to people that we know and love in Christ. We will live together with each other and with Him forever. A future when we won't get up in the morning and look around in the world in our life and go, what in the world is going on here? Because fair 